Okay. All right, we got the official go ahead. So, the if you'd like to, uh, we can dim the lights more if this is not too visible. The thank you for coming to the master class, and I, uh, you know, I got a I got the full uh, dossier on each of you before I came here. So, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Part partially, I know all of your um, PhD topics, and so. Um, and so I saw that some of you are experts in uh, some aspects of what I'm going to talk about. So you'll have to bear with me if I go, if I explain something that you've heard a million times. Maybe you'll hear it a different way. Um, but not all of you are, and you're coming from different backgrounds. So uh, please stop me uh, during the talk and ask me questions. And uh, so this will be more interactive. So uh, not, it's not like the talk tomorrow. The, so my name is Harry Manoharan. I'm a professor at Stanford in the physics department. And uh, because we have a, apparently have a lot of time, we have to go till 10 o'clock tonight, <laughs> the, uh, I'll tell uh, um, some of the background story behind these experiments. And the part of it is historical. The reading material I gave you, I think, is kind of in reverse chronological order. So some of the older stuff, although it may not look directly related, um, even in some of its different materials, some different science, it all kind of contributed to the story of how we got to this point and the overall theme of this, uh, what we're going to talk about today, is really in those two words, hacking electrons. So um, how could we hack electrons to do new things? And, uh, and it's going to end up at uh, these two images here, which is uh, building new materials um, by doing this hacking of electrons. So. The, uh, well, we can start there. I put up these two images. They're from data uh, from our STM. Um, they, all of you will rec recognize them as honeycomb structure or graphene. Um, one of these is actually a real natural graphene, we would call. One is an artificial variant of graphene. Uh, that uh, we constructed in the lab, and we now use this as a basis for even more complex experiments. So this is where I want to end up. Um, so, and I asked you to ask me questions, so I'm gonna start by asking you a question, and maybe you can tell me which one of these is real and which one is not real, which one is virtual, which one is uh, uh, artificial. Anyone wanna guess? Don't be shy, go ahead. Okay, you say the right is artificial. Anyone else? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so now, so, okay, why do you think, so why do you think the right one? Because I know which paper is from when I read it. So you did the homework. <laughs> Any other, so why did you say left besides the counter? <laughs> Okay, good. That's a good guess. Except I didn't tell, I didn't actually put up the the scales here intentionally. So if you knew the scale, then this might tell you the the answer. But actually, I could uh, um, could build the artificial version at at the, essentially the same scale as the uh, the natural one. So um, yeah, anything? Anyone else want to weigh in? Maybe who hasn't read the uh, <laughs> hasn't read the paper. Actually, this, I don't know if this image is in, is in the, the paper, but maybe the same colors. What's that? Come on, you're zooming. <laughs> I also think the right one looks too clean. All right, there we go. So the right one just looks more pure, more yeah. less defects uh, than the one on, on the left. So as it turns out, this is the, our, the artificial form of the graphene that we'll eventually get to in this, uh, in this class. We call this molecular graphene for reasons that hopefully will be apparent. And the left side is, uh, is real graphene. It's a monolayer of graphene on an insulating substrate. Um, and in fact, so that is uh, one, of, you know, one of the primary reasons, motivations for building this artificial form. It's not just to duplicate graphene. One is to build, construct a graphene that's more pure than you can uh, uh, you can otherwise find naturally. 
Um, or if we want to make it impure, we can make it uh, very precisely impure. We can add one impurity or impurities exactly where we want and uh, use that for new physics experiments or even more uh, complicated types of impurities like topological defects okay, or um, edge structures, domains, and so forth. So, uh, and other distortions that I'll talk about today. The, and so the left form, actually, that's pretty pure graphing. Um, to and uh, we, if uh, um, you have high purity graphene, it uh, you can also get that uh, fairly pure, um, not uh, currently as pure uh, as uh, we can do with our molecular graphene. Okay, but there are some trade-offs. Like we can't build infinitely large sheets of this uh, artificial graphene yet, but we've been uh, scaling this up over over the years. So, uh, so. So this is, uh, yeah, so part of this will be a story and uh, of how this came about and along, along with the physics that we learned along the way. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the reason, for example, we use molecules, we call this molecular graphene, uh, is in part um, not driven by the fact that we like molecules. It was driven by the fact that as physicists, we we're basically looking for just the easiest and best building blocks to realize this. And this came about through practical, for practical <coughs> reasons, okay? All right, so the, uh, the, for those of you have, who are familiar with this wave or uh, process and investigations in nanotechnology have all probably um, heard this uh, next quote. And I'll bring it up because I'm gonna revisit this, maybe in a new way. So this is Feynman's famous quote, there's plenty of room at the bottom, or an excerpt from his speech. In 1959, which everyone now says was incredibly prophetic, because he basically, to paraphrase this, was saying that knowing the laws of physics, he said in 1959, he thinks there's no laws of physics that prevent you from actually manipulating matter all the way down to the level of single atoms. And then he says, okay, if that's true, then what could, what, you know, what's possible? What would happen if you could arrange the atoms all the way down, um, all the way to the bottom the way we want them, okay? And so, and of course, 1959, there were nowhere near that plateau or low plateau, and so that's why he's saying there's plenty of room at the bottom. Um, there was also some other interesting things announced in the speech, like a Feynman Prize. I'm gonna come back to that later. Um, so 1959, of course, now, you know, the scanning tunneling microscope, which is one of the workhorse tools now for actually not only seeing but now manipulating <laughs> atoms, was you know not even invented uh, until decades after this speech. And so, uh, to give you an idea, so many of you have probably seen this before. To give you an idea, though, how uh, how strange and uh, out of character, out of place, this. Uh, this particular speech was. Let me give you a counterpoint. And this, I, a lot of you may not have seen this particular quote, which is by another physicist, a contemporary of Feynman's, who says basically the very opposite thing. So this physicist says individual particle is not a well-defined entity of detect, you know, doesn't have detectability. And we never experiment with just one electron or atom or small molecule. And if you do, and so, you know, this is going to uh, entail some ridiculous consequences. So basically, it's a complete counterpart, counterpoint to Feynman's quote. So now I'll ask you another question. Who, which physicist was this? Einstein. Okay, we got one vote for Einstein. <laughs> I'll tell you at the end after we get some more. Sol Dirac. Dirac. Bohr. Bohr. Fermi. Fermi. Max Planck. Max Planck. Give me some more names. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you it's none of those five. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> but someone, what, uh, what's that? Feynman again? <laughs> On a different day. <laughs> Not Feynman again. Contemporary Feynman. Uh, 
Uh, what's that? Leonard Susskind. Leonard Susskind. Good guess. Not Leonard. Heisenberg. So we have Heisenberg. No. <laughs> Who are we missing? Not Linus Pauling. <laughs> You're missing. Uh, well, think about think about the uh, origins of uh, quantum mechanics. Yes. So, <laughs> so just a few years before, actually, Feynman. And so, yeah, so an example, so of course, so one of them was right, one of them was wrong. It took several decades to figure this out. And so, um, another, you know, a, another story that goes with this is that when, my, so we're experimentalists, right? So when uh, my students calculate something or listen to a theorist, and if that result somehow indicates that something is probably not possible in the experiment, um, then I always just tell them, look, if there's some, any, you know, if there's a chance, we have to weigh, like, what's the chance that this will work against, like, you know, if you found something, how useful or, and revolutionary would that be? Which usually means I just tell them to, like, screw it. If you, you know, someone says that something's impossible, just try it. You're an experimentalist and do it. You can always go back and figure out why or why. And if it didn't work, well, maybe you can figure out why it didn't work. So in this case, it, is, it was possible to do what, what Feynman said, and it's a good lesson in, in history. And uh, I put that up there also to come back, just keep this plenty of room at the bottom in mind. Let me go through my first, uh, first uh, experiment here, OK? So, so that, that instrument, scanning tunneling microscope, which many of you use, or have, and I think uh, most of you have heard about, is here I'm just diagrammed in a cartoon way with some, maybe the important, I just want to get out of the way uh, some of the types of data that we acquire, so we're all on the same page. So starting with this, we've got uh, typically a surface, it's somehow some part of it is conducting so that it can, uh, we can pass current through it from a tip that's some distance away, usually a few angstroms, separated by vacuum, which is the black part here. And um, we tunnel electrons from the tip to the surface or, or in reverse. And uh, we scan this tip around. So that's the scanning and the tunneling part. And uh, the microscopy is due to a, a gift from nature that basically this tunnel current is exponentially sensitive to distance. So, um, and remarkably, this, uh, all the constants work out uh, in a convenient way for, tip, for typical materials. So meaning that um, you change just that distance by an angstrom, and you get an order of magnitude um, change in this current. So it's this huge magnification factor that nature has given us. So we have this tunnel junction now as a huge magnification tool for tiny distances, so tiny that you could measure even the difference between the tops of these atoms and the hollows between them fairly easily. Okay, so the um, and then so for those of you who do STM, you know this. For those of you who don't do this in practice, I'll point it out. This is not always obvious that we the scanning part of this tip can be done just blindly. But if you do that blindly, eventually you'll, you'll cra do what's called crashing this tip into the surface, which typically messes things up, your surface and, you and your tip. And if you want to keep everything uh, constant in time uh, so your experiment is more reliable, you don't want to do that. And so we have some external apparatus, electronics, that not only is biasing with a voltage uh, this tip against the uh, sample so that we can pass a current, but this electronics is also scanning this tip around, and it's stabilizing it in this vertical or Z direction above the surface, with, and that's typically done with a feedback loop. Now, that feedback loop does is try to maintain, well, typical way, it's to maintain a constant current, so that when under the feedback loop guidance, as this tip is scanned laterally, it will undulate up and down in order to keep a constant current going down in the hollows and going up above the atom. And in fact, that's the signal that's recorded. Okay, or one signal that's recorded, typically called topographic signal. I'll mention it more later um, because it's something like a to physical topograph of the surface, like what you would feel, although uh, technically it's a topograph of what we call the local density of states at a particular energy. 
All right, so, and then I like this picture, which is from the Nobel lecture from the STM inventors, um, because that's a different view. It's a, the tip is actually a more of a jumbled mess, probably. We never actually, we typically never uh, view the tip or image the tip, although you can do it in uh, other experiments. Um, again, another useful way to image what's going on is just think of the electron clouds uh, around all the atoms. They, they don't go suddenly away from having electrons somewhere and then going away. They have an exponential tail. And when you overlap these exponential tails from the tip and the sample, then this is where you get a tunnel current. Okay. So another, so I, some useful orders of magnitude are, you know, this might be, this gap I mentioned is a uh, few angstroms, let's say. You can uh, bring this tip uh, that probably uh, you could say what is you could ask what is the closest approach you could bring this tip to the sample, and you know we're not measuring direct uh, sorry um, absolute distances in the STM we're measuring relative distances we're measuring it through this tunnel current or um, if you think of this as an electrical circuit we're measuring the the resistance of that tunnel junction the closest you can get to moving the tip towards the surface is probably what we call quantum point contact, okay? And beyond that, you're really plowing into the surface, but at quantum point contact, you've made the light, lightest possible quantum uh, connection to, to the surface, between the tip and the surface, okay? So in terms of resistance of the tunnel junction, who can tell me what is that, what's that resistance? That's another benchmark. About 30 kilo ohms. About 30 kilo ohms? What's that? 13. Okay, 12.9. Right. So, um, so that's right. So that's the quantum of conductance or resistance, and uh, and this is a, a you know a number we pay attention to when we're doing our experiments. And a in the, in a bigger picture, what I'm going to talk about is atomic manipulation shortly. You can ask a question: Why doesn't everyone do atomic manipulation um, if you have an STM? And the reason is because to do atomic manipulation, typically you need to get very close to point quantum point contact uh, in order to do the manipulation. And whereas typically to image, you can be very far from the sample. In terms of resistances, this could be mega ohms or typically it's giga ohms. Okay, so it orders of magnitude, a larger tunnel junction resistance. So if you're manipulating atoms, you're closer, you're in point contact, you're that much closer to the surface. That means you're that much more sensitive to external vibrations and uh, bad things happening that will crash your tip into the sample. And so that's basically the limiting factor of building large structures and looking at uh, structures long, over long periods of time that you make with atomic manipulation. Yeah. So not completely independent. It is. It does depend on some details of yeah the the last atom on the tip and what you're tunneling into. But as a as an order of magnitude, this is this is a good number for. So an order of magnitude is a good number for for typical metals. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, okay. So so let me uh, again for. Um, oh yeah, so there's my magnification factor up there to repeat again. So, um, so for those of you who um, are not completely familiar with an STM, this is like the animation that you can always keep in mind. So with the feedback loop going um, activated, this tip is scanning across the surface and being rastered. Okay, so that was one scan. Now we move it down to um, the next uh, the next direction, let's call that Y. So now it's scanning an X fast and Y slow. It's going over an atom in this case, and we're recording all that data in a computer, and that's giving us what we, this our topographic image that I referred to earlier, and we often when you see an STM image, like the ones I showed in the, in the title slide, those were basically, those were acquired in exactly this way. Now that image could be different depending on the voltage on the tip, okay? So, so that's STM in a nutshell. How do you do it? Well, you have to have some vibration proof and vibration that, uh, in, in general, it's your, your STM is gonna be sensitive to vibration and you wanna isolate it. Uh, 
There's other tricks. Uh, you want to isolate your, your system from um, other kinds of interference. And uh, you, know, you, can buy, you can buy STM instrumentation now uh, from, from different vendors. Uh, that wasn't always true. So in the history of the STM, the first ones were made <laughs> from scratch. So it turns out, that, so our, our s systems that we dedicate to atomic manipulation are also completely handmade. Um, the, uh, why? Because um, that it's still, I think, the best way to get to do the most precise experiments, although I think there's always refinements in the commercial instrumentation. Um, this particular instrument we built when I first came to Stanford, my, my start date at Stanford was 111. So January 1st, 2001. So that's when we started building this instrument. It took about three years, and uh, starting from scratch, and also to build a lab around it. And uh, so we have these now several uh, scanning probe systems that, that are built from scratch. And uh, this particular one I show is the one that's dedicated to doing this uh, full-time at atomic manipulation, which I'll talk about. So I mentioned isolation from the environment. What's well, a common thing if you if you do experiments, you know this well. If you have a friend who does it, then you've probably heard about this. You're, you don't want, you want uh, just people walking around your experiment is bad, but even in the rest of the building. So typically you go down low where there's less vibration. And uh, you might have other gizmos to isolate from vibration, like you know, basically shock absorbers between the system and the floor. You can also, there's, but just, uh, vibration of the floor is not the only thing. There's acoustic vibration, so vib is, is another form of noise. So you can soundproof and uh, to help this. There's also vibration that just comes from thermal motion. So to get around that, what do you do? You cool down your system. So you can go to lower temperatures to eliminate natural thermal motion. Um, and so what I'm showing in this picture here is uh, this STM, we're in, it's inside, it's de we're down in a sub-basement and uh, in our physics building, it's an old building, which t with, uh, old buildings have uh, much less vibration, I've found, because they, have, they use a lot more concrete. And then it, there's a soundproof chamber around the instrument um, and several layers of cascaded passive isolation, these shock absorbers, to um, isolate out ground motion. Then for the temperature, we typically do experiments at four Kelvin, which is liquid helium temperature, or, or we go down below. And in, uh, in this particular system, we also have a, a, a very strong magnetic field, well, uh, a reasonably strong magnetic field up to about 11 Tesla. And uh, although in everything I'm gonna show you today, um, we don't use a real magnet but yet we still achieve a magnetic field in our sample, which I'll show you later. A magnetic field that's 30 Tesla, or now we're up to 300 Tesla, but without a magnet. So how do we do that? That's part of uh, the story today. Um, and finally, it, with all this isolation, you can kind of test like how, uh, how sensitive uh, you are to uh, small distances by looking at resolution. Um, so we all know how big atoms are. They're angstrom size or a tenth of a nanometer. Our resolution now is approaching the femtometer scale with all of this isolation. So femtometer being 10 to minus 15 meters. And uh, so of course that's orders of magnitude smaller than an atom and you can ask why, if we're looking ultimately at real materials, right, with grain size, granularity of atoms, or why do you need this uh, very sensitive resolution because everything's made of atoms, right? Well, as I'll show you, and that's part of the title, hacking electrons, right? It's all about the electrons. And in fact, to see electrons, we don't see them as particles. We see them as waves, and uh, we look at their wave functions. And so um, having very high resolution and spatially mapping out wave functions is the main utility of this high resolution okay, in these quantum materials that we're looking at. All right, so here's... Here's another picture of just the guts of uh, this particular STM. We have uh, every, every scanning probe has some kind of coarse motors on it and some kind of fine motors. 
The coarse motors is to, to move your tip just within some reasonable distance of the sample you're trying to probe, and then the fine motors take over to do that scanning that I animated earlier. So we, we happen to do this. There's, there's all kinds of designs for, uh, for STMs. We happen to do this all with, so we do everything with piezos and electrostatics. Um, and with uh, capacitor clamps. So we use basically a sequence of um, capacitor clamps and, and large piezos to move this uh, STM, which is sitting here. This is about a centimeter across. Um, move it around by millimeters. Um, that's our course motion. And then we can lock it down with capacitor clamps very, uh, very solid, solidly. Uh, and then we use some other piezos, which are di pointed out here, X, Y, and Z, to do the fine motion, and that's the scanning I showed you. In this case, this, there's no, the sample is removed here. It sits vertically in, in this uh, particular microscope. And uh, so that you, so it's removed so you can see the rest of, you can see the STM tip. So the tip is there sticking out where the sample would go. Okay, so if now, so th this is, uh, we're going to talk about atomic manipulation. But um, before I go there, let me turn to first just the imaging. Okay, we'll start with imaging. So if you have a very fine uh, resolution and stability, then of course this helps also with imaging. Um, I mentioned the wave functions, they're um, actually visible. Uh, in different ways in these different materials that I show up here, okay? So um, this is just some collection that of uh, different materials. There's two superconductors in the middle. There's real graphene on the left, and on the left and the right is a very simple material, copper. It's a one, copper crystal with the 111 face, um, just at a, at a small length scale and a, a larger length scale. And so the, this basically, and so that'll be these, this copper and uh, these two images form some backbone of what I'll talk about today. Um, this picture I really like because it's, um, it's almost, uh, you can consider this almost a textbook picture of wave particle duality. You always, you know, you all know about from quantum mechanics, the wave particle duality, why? Well, first of all, you see that there are some patterns here that don't look um, quite regular, the white. Um, but if you stare at them for a while, they look almost wave-like in nature. And in fact, they are waves. They're waves, they're electron waves, or the standing waves of two-dimensional electrons sloshing around on the surface. Okay. Um, so the electrons, at least the ones that, we, that are not localized, that are delocalized in this two-dimensional surface state of this copper, we image as waves, but yet underlying that is a regular lattice, and those are the copper atoms, which we image as particles. Why? Because they effectively have very large mass because they're locked into a lattice with every other atom in this crystal. And so they're localized to atomic sites, okay, as well as the, as well as the, as the core electrons around each copper atom. So that's wave particle duality in one picture. The other part of this talk will be about then adding something extra to this, uh, to these ingredients and manipulating it to uh, make new structures. Okay. All right, so, so let's, let's talk about that now, the manipulation. So this slide is about, um, it's about going, it's kind of like reversing the second law of thermodynamics. So it's about um, decreasing entropy. This is a high entropy state, so just throwing something down on the ground on your surface, and here's a low entropy state of the same materials. Okay? And starting with one of the first things that was done when uh, atomic manipulation was invented by Don Eigler, which is graffiti. You've all seen of the uh, atomic scale graffiti, right? The IBM logo spelled out in atoms. Um, the, we've now moved beyond graffiti, although one, my first example will be actually an electron form of graffiti to, get, to set the stage for the rest. So I'll come back to that, but these are, this first row here is basically a before image, and then an after image of various experiments that were done at these increasing length scales from 
your 25 angstroms to 150 angstroms. Just to give you an idea of uh, different kinds of structures and experiments, this number down at the bottom is the number of units, either atoms or molecules, that, that were assembled to make these ordered structures, these quantum structures. So starting from 5 up to 135, um, the materials I'll talk about at the end, these graphene materials, now st they're way to the right on this axis. They're um, up to about uh, a thousand, over 1,000 uh, atoms or molecules, say 1,200 maybe. So um, the other ingredients that you can see here are these electron waves. So these particular, actually these three are examples of what we call quantum corrals, quantum dots basically. Uh, what we put into the wall confines electrons to the interior, and um, you get almost textbook-like pictures of uh, the solution to Schrodinger equation, particle in a box. Okay, for example, this is a circle, and the, what you can just read out directly with this STM, with the, and these are tiny modulations in the, um, in the signal, um, correspond, in this case, to great fidelity to Bessel functions, which is just... Um, the direct um, theoretical solution to the particle in a box problem for this particular uh, geometry. This is an ellipse. These are more, comp I, I think I'll say a little bit more about these in a minute. So, so let's, these are all uh, um, different experiments. Let me say, you know, from, say a bit more about going from here to here. So what happens in between, and I'll talk a little bit about this manipulation process. All right, so here's filling in some more of the intervening steps. Um, for very small structures, these are one, two examples. The first row is just putting seven molecules together into a bigger uh, kind of quantum dot. The surface state here and the electrons there are not so important for that. Here's one case of building a very small quantum corral. We call it an isospectral resonator. I'll say more about this in a minute. But I, I, want, I put this up here because I want you to keep in mind the sizes. Here, for, like, for example, this is a 100 angstrom image. Um, but we can, a useful number to ask is when we build these kind of corrals for the electrons, is how many electrons are inside? So that, keep in mind, this is a surface state on the sample. And so there's a fixed density of two-dimensional electrons, right? Number of electrons per area on the surface. So you can basically change the number of electrons that are held inside by changing the size of this quantum corral. And you can count them, okay? And so this particular one has six electrons inside. So um, keep that in mind when we go to the uh, lattices I'll talk about, because we, it's a similar trick we do to change effectively the doping of these uh, artificial materials we use. So, um, so, what do we, so let, let me just say now, let's dive a little bit deeper into the manipulation process, okay? Even what's going on between these, uh, in order to do, uh, between these images in order to do the manipulation. So the, uh, what's going on there is, as I alluded to earlier, in normal operation, the STM tip is far from the sample. Why? Because, well, at least it's far enough away that it doesn't move anything around. Because if you're just trying to image the sample, that's the first rule of imaging. You don't want to monkey around with what you're looking at. So you keep the sample, you keep the tip as far away as possible so you're not moving anything around while you're imaging. To do manipulation, we want the opposite. And as I mentioned, this requires coming uh, for some, for example, metals, almost to quantum point contact, to do what's diagrammed here. And this is, a, this is generally what we're um, this is generally what we're doing for a particular kind of manipulation we call the lateral manipulation. All right, so here's our tip. In general, this, let's say this, that our target atom, or it could be a molecule, is, uh, is bound to the surface. Um, the, the weaker, the better. If it's a van der Waals bond, that's good. And then it is also, in general, has no interaction with the tip unless we bring the tip in close, and then we can have the same type of bond between the last atom on the tip and the thing we want to move. So in this case, the way I've drawn it, there's two uh, competing forces, one vertical or one wanting to pull this atom up onto the tip, and the other one wanting to keep it down on the surface. Remarkably, or perhaps you know, surprisingly to you, we can go into this mode and then reliably keep this mode 
and move this atom by just uh, staying, balancing these forces and then moving the tip laterally, bringing the atom with it, with the tip, and then moving the tip away and then the atom is in a new atomic location that we choose. We can do this very precisely. So you might think this is kind of an unstable situation, but you can, con uh, you know, it's, uh, you can convince yourself it's not by making toys. Uh, we can, uh, in my lab, we have uh, uh, several models of this. You could have a row of, area of array of marbles and uh, put another marble with a magnet in it. And put a magnet here on a tip and just try moving this ball around. The magnetic force now, attraction basically simulates this bond, and gravity simulates these bonds. And in fact, if you do this with your hand, well, you can mess it up, but there is basically a sweet spot and you can um, access it with your hand and move this marble across the row. Um, uh, the, the other, the array of marble, other marbles on the, on the table and then pick up the tip and then that, that atom stays in the new, new location. So um, it is possible, but you need to, uh, to be careful, if you go in too close, you'll pick up this atom. That might not be a bad thing. Maybe that's what you wanted to do, and that's another type of manipulation we do, which is called vertical manipulation. There's a, maybe a third type of manipulation we do, which is sending current pulses uh, through our target. And this tends to work for atoms that have high electric polarizability. So things like uh, xenon atoms have a huge um, uh, electron cloud around it can be more easily polarized and you can do vertical manipulation with this. So um, so these are the types of manipulation. There was a question here. Uh, no, I was just going to ask if the surface force isn't enough to hold it on so you can kind of pull it along. You just answered my question. So that, okay, so that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so for doing this kind of lateral manipulation, we don't want to pick it up, but we don't, we need, we need enough attractive force to do, uh, in order to balance the the surface bonds. Okay, so the, now if this is a, a molecule and we're going to come to uh, the particular molecule I'll talk about has a, a, role, a big role later is carbon monoxide. Then the situation looks uh, like this, that's shown in this animation. This animation is, has some real components to it. Um, so it's, this is obviously not something we directly image, but um, at least in the way this movie is shown. But uh, let me just show you this. So the tip there is up in uh, purple, and now it's coming in to essentially grab this molecule. Um, and you might notice there's some jiggling of this molecule, which is actually real, and this happens in the experiment. Um, it happens to a lesser extent for single uh, species like at single atoms, okay. and uh, and so this is that was basically the whole scheme. You come in, target to the target molecule. You come in, drag it to some new location, and uh, pull up the tip. And uh, we do this um, repeatedly with very high yield. Okay. Once and uh, you know we can usually find the for the for a combination of ingredients surface and add atoms or add, add or, uh, molecules on top, we can uh, find the sweet spot, the right parameters to do this for a wide variety of materials. Okay. Um, yeah? How do you notice the jiggling in your experiment? So the, uh, how, do we, how do we notice the uh, jiggling? Good question. We listen to it. <laughs> so, so uh, this is a, what I'm going to, what we've learned after doing this um, uh, for a long time is that every species sounds different. So yeah, I could keep, so even let's keep the surface the same, put different species of atom, even just going one away in periodic table. Um, you know, go, going from a gold atom to a silver atom, okay? Uh, you're both noble metals but it will sound slightly different, okay? So every species sounds different. Why is this as we move it? And uh, uh, what are we listening to? In this case, we're just listening to the same thing that is always being recorded. There's a tunnel current always flowing, even during this manipulation process. It's actually a larger current during that because our tip's closer in for the same voltage, right? And uh, 
this is something like in the lab, you might be always sending to your oscilloscope and perhaps monitoring. What we've learned over time is that uh, it's really valuable to sometimes just always listen to this, and it, but with our ears, okay? So uh, the one reason is that first it helps guide us in the manipulation process. So think of it this way, our, atom, our, our, uh, our tip of the STM, it's, it's basically uh, normally functioning like our eyes. We're scanning to take imaging. That's how we image the surface, right? But to do this manipulation, we have to stop the scanning. Therefore, we're blind. And now it becomes our hands to reach out and grab something and move it. So during that manipulation process, we're blind. We can pick something up, put it down. But to see it again, we have to re-image. But this, the sound listening to the tunnel current actually allows us to do the manipulation process with another real-time feedback signal or listening to, with it to our ears. And we can uh, assemble structures actually by ear this way without needing to look at uh, things. We've actually now tra trained our computer to do the same thing, uh, to automatically assemble these uh, bigger structures. So let me actually just play what, it, so what I'm talking about. We can talk. I'm sure there'll be some questions. All right. The, uh, this is species one, mystery species. All right, so what did you hear? A bunch of clicks. Um, actually, what's, one thing that's very important here is what you didn't hear. Because for a typical STM, this would not be possible. You would hear just a lot of white noise. So in order to be able to pick out that, that kind of modulation, you already have to have a very quiet system so that your noise level is really low, so you don't hear a large noise signal. And then what you do hear primarily is, this, is the sound of the manipulation. So the background sound is very low. Um, there was like a, a bit of ringing, maybe if you listen carefully. That's always present in any STM, which comes from basically the um, the, the resonant frequency of the STM itself. Uh, the, the smaller you make that, um, the STM, the higher that frequency is, and the, usually the, the better isolation you have. So we try to make our, or we handmade our microscope really small for that reason. But what you heard hopefully mostly is a bunch of clicks. And uh, this is basically taking the species. Just think about what you do. Yeah, you roll, you have a, you have a, 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 a flat array of marbles put into a lattice, and you roll another marble across it. What does it do? It clicks into each hollow, into position. Okay, and that's exactly what that sound was. Um, before I tell you what that was, let me just give you a, a counter example here. Hopefully, this sounds a lot different. <laughs> that's not noise. It's a real. That's real data. OK. Um, surface is the same. The species is different. Um, any guesses as to what these are? <laughs> OK, there we go. It's, some, it's, it's got to be related somehow. So as it turns out, each, electron, each tunneling electron that comes from the STM tip is doing a Schrodinger's cat measurement. Um, but for these currents, we're actually averaging out over all of those measurements and getting you know, the, uh, the quantum average, uh, the average over all those quantum experiments. So uh, any, any other guess? The noisier one, is it like uh, is it a simpler species further down the periodic table? Any guesses? It's, uh, okay, one guess, a molecule. Which one? Yeah, CO. Yeah. Well, okay, CO, but which, which species, which uh, sound? The first one or the second? The, se the, the one I just played? So, yeah, so, so, yeah, why do you say that? Mole uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. So, I mean, so it goes, someone asked a question about uh, why the motion, is, right? So that vibration motion is a degree of freedom that a molecule has that an atom doesn't, OK? An atom can is basically, as you're sliding, it's making and breaking the bond it has to the surface, right? 
and that's the only thing that could jiggle. But a molecule in the junction can flip around, rotate, um, and you hear ex more a different tenor because of that noise. Okay. Um, now the uh, there's a, there's like a rhythmic uh, you know there's basically for each one of these there's noise and then there's quiet regions right it's more I think it's more obvious for this one it's quiet and then it's maximally noisy <laughs> and quiet again and this is actually just telling you something directly about the um, about the uh, uh, the bonding of this species and the surface so. The first one was just a copper atom, an individual copper atom on top of copper. Um, and it was moving like this, so locking into the hollows of the surface underneath, and really with a clicking sound, just like the marble. And the second one was moving like this. It turns out, and it is a CO molecule, so it turns out that these CO molecules like to bond directly on top of the copper. And so where, uh, now you heard quiet, you heard that CO molecule be really quiet, and you heard it be very noisy. So where's the noisy part? Okay, we hear it. So the noisy part on top, in the middle, what do you say? Yeah, so actually it's, it's, when, it's when it's frustrated. When you try to force it to be in the middle, that black dot here, it's maximally noisy because it can't decide where to go. And you hear a lot more jiggling. It's quiet when it's perfectly happy on its preferred bonding site. Okay? And so imagine that, um, imagine there's more you can push, you can, uh, you can push this further. Um, if you can do this manipulation, then we can take entire images while manipulating the thing that uh, we're building out of. And in this way, we get actually a view of the surface through this single atom. And you see exactly every, every place where it likes to sit on the surface. Um, and so same with CO. And you can see even like you could try, you could, we could add other structures. You could actually force these molecules on the sites they don't prefer by adding uh, constraints on the surface and so forth. Okay? So this is, a, this is a, an important kind of uh, way of imaging surface, like, like seeing seeing a world through the eye, you know, the, the eye of a single atom. So there's some questions here, yeah. So this sounds real fine? Okay, so the sounds are, are no processing and no frequency shifting, just taken, taken direct, yeah, real time and just sent into our lab stereo system and recorded. So a detail is actually the movement of those atoms and molecules, even that CO jiggling, is happening over all kinds of frequency scales from milliseconds um, up to frequencies like terahertz. But since we're sending our signal directly and just listening to it, we only hear you know, the, audio, the human audio part of that up to 20 kilohertz or so. All that other terahertz motion is still there. We can detect it other ways, um, but not directly in audio. Okay. Or it's essentially, you could say it's also kind of essentially mixed down into what we hear. Okay. Another question? Yep. Yeah. Oh. What do you mean exactly by that? All right, so that, so that was kind of an aside, but I'll, I'll mention it because it's another way of looking at this STM. So one, each, elect, each electron coming, one, just a single electron coming out of the tip of the STM goes, goes into the sample. Um, let's say, uh, so there's, it's tunneling into uh, another state. That state in general, the final state is some, could be a superposition state. And like a Schrodinger's cat, okay, and that electron has to choose or basically collapse this state. When, you know, so each single electron is doing this, is just tunneling. Now, if you had a superposition with some probability of two states and the electron has to choose one, then over time, the probability will just be the average, uh, the coefficients out in front of the superposition. And so um, this is. Uh, this is something we've explored in some other experiments, it's, um, which I won't go into detail here, but it was one of the, the, I think it was the last paper I put in the reading about uh, gating superpositions. So that there's like some explanation in there. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So 
The any other anything else in this? The sounds. Okay. So it, the summary is we're basically switching back and forth between these two modes. The imaging mode is shown here, tip far away. And then the manipulation mode where we form what's called, we call this a tunable bond here because we can tune how strong that bond is just by the distance uh, from the tip. All right, so that's the, some the mechanics behind uh, the manipulation. The other ingredients and the, and the other characters that show up in this story um, were alluded to earlier. So I mentioned the copper surface, the 111 face in particular, and I mentioned these 2D electrons. Let me say a little bit more about that. This is my wave particle duality picture okay, I showed you before. Um, this surface state, here's another uh, representation of it. Uh, let's say you've got the atoms. This is going perpendicular to the surface. You've got the atoms terminating at the surface. So there's some big, in green there, a big work function that's keeping electrons from shooting out of the surface. Um, but for the right boundary conditions, doesn't, happen, doesn't have to happen, but it ha happens to happen for copper and, some, and a variety of other materials, you can get a pileup of electron density right at the surface. It's what we call a surface state. Different materials have different character surface states. Um, this particular one for copper and the no other noble metals, gold and silver, is very, gives a very isotropic two-dimensional electron gas, a very isotropic surface state, meaning it's got a dispersion that's uh, basic, like a, a parabola that's uniform in x and y. Okay. Why does that happen? Different materials, different, different reasons. Um, for copper, gold, and silver, this is what the band structure looks like. The bulk electrons have a bulk band gap, and the surface state sits right in the middle of it. If, if you um, are familiar with band theory and Fermi surfaces, um, when you look along the 111 direction of copper, gold, for example, there are these necks along the 111 direction. The surface state sits inside the neck, okay? And that's why it's isolated from all the bulk states. So it's a nice, it's a remarkable occurrence, happens in uh, um, only a few materials, this particular arrangement. And it, what it does is it, is it uh, energetically isolates this surface state from the bulk electrons. So you have some 2D electrons that are decoupled, actually in general completely from the bulk. But they will get coupled if there's any defects. But you always have defects. For example, as you see here, even these, these are single, uh, these are step edges that are each one atom high. Those defects will couple uh, the 2D to the 3D. And then the atoms or the molecules we add later will also do that. So, but the picture looks something like this. We, this is density of states, or as I'll show you, we access this with, with, by measuring uh, the connectivity, differential connectivity, DIDV. Um, there's a bulk background. There's a background of, from the 3D um, electrons. And then on top of that, in almost textbook uh, quality, you may, if going back to your solid state physics, if you've, if you've seen this before, if you have a 2D, 2D electron density states, it's just a constant. So where this band starts, there's a jump up to a constant density of states, and that's the, that's the 2D electron band formed here. I say, with, if you now start adding stuff to the surface, you can confine the electrons in a quantum crowd, and you'll further modulate this density of states. All right, so that's the energetic picture of the surface state. Here's, of course, we try to do, um, now if we're, we want to build something, we want big, it's like building a house, right? You want a big flat place first. So you, um, you try to get a good, clean your sample well. Here's a better, uh, more space to, to build. It still has some steps. And then you go and uh, build, here's another view, the atoms and the electrons. Um, here's an even bigger plateau. And now finally, this is the last ingredient, which is now manipulating the electrons in that 2D surface state. So you, you can see here from any defects or some add atom that now that the electrons basically respond to, the, to them. They respond actually in ways that you can calculate uh, fairly precisely, but in, in complementary ways. You could do scattering theory that you've learned about in quantum mechanics, and you could see these wave-like ripples around each one. Okay. 
Um, so we know that we can interact with the surface state electrons that way. So this is basically the key to now ha doing the hacking of these electrons. So what can we, um, what can we do? So to intentionally do this, that's the last ingredient. So you want to build, you need your, the blocks to build your house. So we dose something intentionally now, our building blocks onto the surface. So I already mentioned carbon monoxide, so here they are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these are now individual molecules, these little, uh, per, uh, these little circular bumps here. These black lines are, are the step edges that you saw earlier. <clears throat> They're circularly symmetric. Um, common question is why? Because this is carbon monoxide, right? Carbon and oxygen, they don't have to be. In fact, the molecule isn't but it is along its axis. And as it turns out, carbon monoxide sticks straight up and down on the surface. So I already said it bonds to the copper. This it bonds carbon down, oxygen up. So as viewed from above, it's basically circul like a circul circular. You might expect a circular bump out of the surface. It is actually sticking out of the surface. A detail that's due to the, chemis the local chemistry and electronegativity of this uh, CO molecule. Um, is that it images actually as a depression when you do this topographical map rather than a bump. And that means basically around it, it's harder to tunnel electrons into this combination. So the tip has to come in closer to the sample above it. But this is just a detail. And I will, I'll mention a, let me tell you one story from the past. Because an another common question is why, car why do we use carbon monoxide? So I will tell you, uh, something from my own history, which was that, um, so, that, so before I was at Stanford, I was at IBM, and I was working with Don Eigler. The, um, or maybe a, a, a preface to that story is that my, um, my background in, uh, as an undergrad, I did research in semiconductor physics. As a grad, I was interested in reduced dimensional systems um, after that. So for my PhD, I worked in two-dimensional electron gases in really clean semiconductors, gallium arsenide. So we did the growth of these, MBE, and also these low temperature measurements. The low temperature measurements, so we're, and we're looking at very exotic states, like the quantum Hall effect, um, and even new particles, which you could synthesize or get, see in these, uh, see in these 2D gases, like skirmions and high magnetic field or fractional charges and so forth. So this has all long been an interest of mine. Um, but what, because we were doing transport measurements, something that left me very unfulfilled is that we were talking always about these exotic states that often had predictable spatial order, but yet we could never see them. We had to infer everything from a transport measurement. So that's why I got into imaging. And I went to IBM because because they invented the STM, <laughs> so I figured that's a good place to start. And I was also interested in the ultimate, you know, vision of Feynman's dream. If we can actually manipulate materials, why not build new materials from scratch? And that's what we're doing now. So, CO, at IBM, while doing other experiments, we would often see, you know, you always see some defect or crud on the sample that you don't want. And we, would, we often see what we just call them mystery defects. We don't know what they are. Um, and we can only do some limited experiments if you don't know what it is to figure it out. But a common thing you can do, if you don't know what something is, you could try to intentionally guess what it is and dose more of it and see if it behaves the same, same way. So we ended up seeing these things that we call, we used to call these, um, sorry, we used to call these uh, good dips. Good dips. We didn't know what they were. And we said they're good dips because we, we realized that when we, they, we could manipulate them really well. And actually, if we had enough of these good dips around, we could build little structures out of them. And we re start to learn that this is like a really good building material. If only we knew we could figure out what this thing was. So in between a, you know, more useful experiments, usually on at that time, mag we were looking at magnetic atoms and, and other things, condo effect. Um, in a downtime, maybe before we're gonna warm up and fix something, we would just go down our list of candidates and hook up another doser and just dose another thing onto the sample and see, hey, is this the good dip? We'd get a bunch of crud on the sample and then see, does this behave just like the good dips? So you're we like going through hydrogen, helium, common impurities, carbon monoxide, water. We got to, uh, 
carbon dioxide. We got to carbon monoxide and bingo, that was it. So we figured out our good dips and after that we could start doing experiments on these good dips building uh, more complex structures. So that's the history of how we got into that. Uh, once we knew it was CO, then we could go back to a vast literature that surface scientists had done a long time ago. Just surface scientists had put, you know, you know, you name, you name it on all, you know, you name it dosing on all kinds of substrates, and they would do um, measurements of vibrational modes, coverage, and things like that. So once we knew it was CO, we could actually go back to that literature, um, read off other physical properties, and actually learn backwards, you know, what these things should be doing. But no one had seen this, like, basically at the single, ad single molecule before. Yeah. Did you also have bad dips? Like yes, we have bad, we have bad dips. <laughs> the bad, our bad dips on copper are sulfur. And because sulfur is the um, most common, most prevalent uh, impurity in copper. Yeah. And it's, shall it's shallower. The bad dip is, like, uh, half this. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's kind of manipulated. Right? Yes, that's right. So we just try to get rid of them. Like, get rid of them by doing better sample, sample prep. Okay, so, any, so historical note on that. So that's how it started and for us. And so um, back to the manipulation and the electrons. I mentioned quantum corrals. This is a, a picture of, I'm keeping my eye on the time because it's 8.45 is, our, is supposed to be the break time. So I will obey that. Um, the, uh, this is a process of assembling a more complicated quantum corral than those circles and ellipses I showed you. Um, I don't have time to tell you the full details of these experiments, but this, the main point is that this ultimately is a closed structure, okay, or what we refer to as a closed structure. And you can view the electron shapes inside. It's basically at the eigenmodes of solving Schrodinger equation inside this um, Clo a boundary condition set um, by the walls that we hear. The COs are packed so closely in the walls that you don't even see their granularity. Okay, so um, here's another, here's some other pretty pictures of uh, some other, a more complicated structure. These are what we call these isospectral resonators. And um, I will, maybe I'll show you this, I'll start with this picture. So. These, uh, these two actually have names that were not given, given uh, named by us. They're actually, these shapes are named by math, math, mathematical physicists, Bilby and Hawke. And the experiment here, whose details I won't go into, but I'll just tell you the summary of what we found. But you can read about it in, um, in the paper that we, uh, um, we put in, that, uh, in the handout. Um, the point of this experiment goes back to a, an old riddle in physics and a, a very famous paper, which you can all look up. And the name of this paper has got a cool title. It's the, name of the, the title of this paper is Can You Hear the Shape of a Drum? And so it was written by Mark Koch in, the, in uh, the 60s. And it was asking a very simple question. Um, even Lorentz had worked on this problem. If you have a shape and you solve, you solve uh, let's say a drum, something as simple as a drum, right? You solve, you can solve a par partial differential equation, a wave equation, and you get a spectrum, right? And so a bunch of uh, frequencies. And uh, so Mark Koch was asking about the reverse of this. So if you had perfect pitch, you could hear all those frequencies, could you tell, unique, tell me uniquely what is the shape? I play a drum behind my back and you can hear all the frequencies. Can you tell me uniquely what is the shape of that drum? So can you hear the shape of a drum? And the answer is either yes or no. But it took um, almost three decades to, to actually answer that question. And it turns out it was, there's an interesting history. It was first answered in 16 dimensions. And this is whittled down to 14. And in one dimension, let's, one dimension, a one dimensional drum is what? It's a string. Can you hear the shape of a string? The answer is yes. It's just the length. And then you just have to listen to the fundamental. So then the question is, so, for some re so that was, was known, one dimension was known, 16 was known, it was cut, two took forever. Do you know what the answer is? Is it yes or no? Can you hear the shape of a drum? Is it like 1D? The answer to 16D is no. The answer to 1D is yes. 
there'd be no reason why you might know one way or another unless you have followed the history. The answer is no. So uh, 2D is like 16D. There, there, you cannot hear the shape of a two-dimensional drum. So there is some built-in ambiguity in the universe uh, between, you know, basically shape and sound, or shape and spectrum. And uh, Bilby and Hawk came out of mathematical solutions, a paper, basically a paper folding method for making shapes onto which, you know, if you solve the wave equation, you were guaranteed to have exactly the same frequencies. So, yeah, so here, forget, so that's just classically was what Koch was talking about. You would hear all of the same uh, eigenfrequencies of a drum in those two shapes. So they would sound exactly the same. But, but sorry? Oh, the wave functions, right? That's what. No, so this is, this is guaranteed for, for all, the entire spectrum. Everything. It's remarkable. So the, and also remarkable was I, like, as I was reading the history, is that the quantum version of this had never been done or tested. The analog is now Schrodinger equation in basically um, these kind of boundary, same boundary conditions. And the analog is now instead of frequencies of, uh, of the drum beating, you're now listening to the eigenenergies of the electrons. And instead of the standing waves on the drum, we're talking about the eigenmodes of the electrons. Okay, but uh, the math should be the same. And so we tested that. Um, and perhaps, I mean, so we found, in fact, we, we, we tested this isospectrality out as far as we could, but there was a surprise at the end, um, which I'll, I'll come back to before we break. Um, let me just say, here's, uh, before I go past this, so these are two isos, it turns out they're isospectral. Um, the, and they're diff but they're different shapes. And you can see that by, you could try to fit this one in that one by rotating it, flipping it, or whatever, and you can't do it. Although they look similar. It turns out they have the same area and, and perimeter. <coughs> they're actually related by a non-trivial transformation. So there's 90 molecules in the wall here, and there's 30 electrons in each one of these. And I, I put these up here first because I wanted to just point out uh, something that's usually not appreciated. These, the, the green dots are where the underlying copper atoms are. Okay? So you can see they're much more closely spaced than, um, say, the wavelength of the 2D electrons inside. And this is like another important, important accident, as it turns out, for us for doing these uh, molecular graphene experiments. Okay, and so the, sorry, the other, these dotted lines, there's blue dots here between the red, those are where the carbon monoxide molecules are, to give you the size scale, okay? Okay, so, um, so I'll mention just the physics highlight of that. There's, um, and this is going back into some, uh, the setup for molecular graphene, is that we were doing a lot of work on detecting quantum mechanical phase, which is something that's in principle hard to do why? Because in a nutshell, quantum mechanics rules say you never can measure the wave function. You only see probability or the wave function squared. Okay? Um, and so in the process, you basically factor it out or you've lost the phase information. Right? But we care about the phase because it determines everything, like the ground state of the system. Quantum information is, all depends on manipulating the phase. So we've been doing several experiments. And I, so the, I put these these uh, experiments for that reason into the handout, um, these three papers, and they, have, they all fed into our, our later work. Okay. This first one in science is uh, about the isospectrality, and, uh, and we've been doing measurements on berry phase and these graphene structures. Let me show you the, a big picture of this. If I have a Hamiltonian, short, that's starting our equation up there, and I'd have some, geom some quantum system um, and I solve Schrodinger equation, and it has, has these energies. If I now squish this system around, it's going to uh, shift all of those uh, energies, right? So, so I change the geometry. These energies shift around. They could even cross. You could have accidental degeneracy. You could have anti-crossing, too. Here's an accidental degeneracy, and um, we were able to use that in um, this paper on the, on the, quant on the quantum gating.
in order to uh, manipulate uh, superposition phase. So that's one type of quantum phase that we got access to with the STM. We were able to also uh, perturb around this to access a Berry phase. So another type of phase. Um, this one is less, is, uh, is actually more profound, but less known. What if I started with two different shapes, A and B? So two different shapes, so they have different eigenstates, eigenlevels, right? And let's say I perturb A, so I squish it around, and it ends up as A prime. It's got that manifold of states. And let's say I squish B around, and I somehow magically arrange it so that the energy levels of this B prime exactly match A prime for all the energies. So you could say, so I could ask you, what happened? You could say, oh, you just distorted B uh, in the same way you distorted A, and they ended up in the same shape. But it turns out that's not the only possible solution. Why? Because I told you the answer to, can you hear the shape of a drum? There's an ambiguity. So it's possible, in fact, that um, these two are not the same. And um, this is now a degeneracy of all of the energy levels. So this is actually a type of topological degeneracy in the state manifold. And uh, it's, uh, it's actually a form of what's called supersymmetry, quantum mechanical supersymmetry. You've heard of supersymmetry. There's in, um, many papers. We, you can look at some of these uh, theory, early theory papers, like by Ed Whitman, <coughs> on uh, supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Basically, in a nutshell, uh, supersymmetry in quantum mechanics is that two different Hamiltonians that have the same solution, the same eigenvalue spectrum. Something very interesting happens when you, when that, when, uh, you can do that wasn't appreciated until we did this quantum drum measurement. And that was a big surprise to us, but it's, that's what we wrote our science paper about, was that it allowed us to you know, go from something like this, where you normally measure psi star psi, which doesn't have any phase information, but at the cost of just making an isospectral twin, so isospectral means has the same energy levels, and measuring that separately, we could combine that data and basically operate uh, the STM as a phase measurement device as we scan across it. And this is actually from the real data. Okay, and so actually measure, get access to the internal phase of the wave function. So that was the nutshell, or the, the final uh, ending point of that, if you want to um, uh, look at the paper. And this, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, connection to what I've been talking about now are these closed quantum structures, okay? And just to show you, to get everyone on the same page, the, what we're talking about when we measure spectra in these is um, DIDV versus voltage, which is local density of states, okay? Yeah? How hard is it to find two such shapes that belong together? I mean, you now have one example that someone figured out years ago, but Yes. So that problem is unsolved. And in fact, only a very small, the only thing in all those years that people have been able to find is a, re, um, a mathematical solution to make pairs. Because all you need is a counterexample. So it's not even known what the bounds are in making you know, triplets that are isospectral and so forth. Although for small structures, you can rule these some out numerically. But in general, a lot is not known. There's an entirely new branch, relatively new branch of mathematics called inverse spectral geometry that this relates to. So it's an inverse spectral problem, very difficult. Okay. So um, let me, sh I'll just show you, I, this is all about just data representation. Um, these are a whole bunch of spectra inside, at different points in these, we call these quantum drums, by the way, inside these uh, structures. Um, this could be any structure. But I just mainly show you this as a representation. You can take these, because we do this later, you can take the DIDV signal, convert it to a color, and you could plot a bunch of traces in whatever order. These happen to be sorted in a certain way, and you get some kind of fingerprint for the structure you're looking at. I mentioned that Bilby and Hawk were the two twins. So if I do this fingerprint for Bilby and Hawk, they look kind of the same. We broke these structures in ways that the, you know, broke the recipe for making them. 
you get something that actually looks similar. If you stare at it for a while, though, you see that hopefully that bilby and hawk look kind of similar, uh, but broken hawk's a bit different. May not be that convincing um, just by eye. But as it turns out, by sound, this is my, my another <laughs> application of sound. These are called quantum drums, by the way. And I do this as a counterpoint because here, the real frequencies that matter are actually terahertz in frequencies. That's the time scale of electrons sloshing around inside these structures, just determined by the Fermi velocity and the size of the structure, okay? or the energy differences between the states. So in this case, we took the spectra, or the average spectrum, and we down-converted it to audible just by scaling it. I think 100, 100 terahertz goes to 1 kilohertz. Um, otherwise, this is just uh, basically the inverse Fourier transform of the average spectrum of each drum, quantum drum. And uh, you can listen to this. That's Bilby. That's Hawk. Hopefully they sound. And that's Broken Hawk where you flip some parts of it. Actually, this has the same area and the same perimeter, but it doesn't follow the rules and it's not isospectral. It's something that we can pick up in the data, but it's very obvious by by listening to it. Okay, so this is like, this is like a more graphical <laughs> representation of that. So we call this measuring quantum phase um, without interferometry, just using geometry. All right, so um, let's take a break. So we'll come back. All right, so we, we just talked about closed quantum structures and I want to make a quick detour toward uh, some open quantum structures. One particular example goes back to Feynman's uh, speech at the beginning, and, uh, and then finish with, uh, with molecular graphene. So here's a, a movie to get us started. So this is carbon monoxide molecules on uh, copper, okay, same system we've been talking about. Assembling a quantum corral, but what I want you to look at is this transition as we go from an open structure to a closed structure, what happens? As we start to fill in these walls, you see basically more confinement. And this is reversing now. You see that uh, structure inside go away as the electrons leak out okay, outside. OK, so what about these open structures? This is a, an experiment we call electron, quantum electron holography. And the inspiration was partly from optics, but it was also uh, partly from appreciation of these, the possibilities of these open quantum structures. So this is the, the uh, motivation here in a, a graphical way, presented in a graphical way. So you all know about, familiar with, you know, museum demonstrations uh, or, you know, physics lab demonstrations of, of holography. You, with lasers, typically, you can take capture a three-dimensional object, um, usually with a reference beam, and encode it in a very dense way uh, into a two-dimensional foil, which we call a hologram. Okay, so somehow all that, three, that rich three-dimensional data is, is uh, converted to a much higher information density in two dimensions. And you can reproduce then, uh, you take this hologram and you re-illuminate it with classical light photons and you will reproject the original object that you see. It's three-dimensional. So you go from 2 to 3D. So the idea here behind, behind our experiment was to actually uh, design some kind of three-dimensional object into the, electron, the electrons, or the electron density of states, okay, by making a two-dimensional electron hologram, electronic hologram. Our three dimensions will be x, y, and energy. This is kind of a, looks like a haphazard uh, thing that we're projecting there. We call that our electronic object, okay? And our hologram now is gonna be a really small hologram. It's gonna be this area of a sample, which is devoid of any defects. Um, and actually, that's where we're gonna read out the hologram. The actual hologram is the analogy of this thing that looks, um, uh, looks like something undecipherable compared to this cat, is basically going to be a very precise collection of carbon monoxide molecules, okay? So uh, in principle, 
we figured we could make any three-dimensional electronic object and basically encode that into electrons. But another thing that also I was interested in was uh, back to going, you know, going back to Feynman's challenge there was seeing how much information could we store? Or was there some kind of uh, de uh, density limit? How much could we store in information can we store in these holograms? How far can we push that density? Or how much room is there at the bottom in that sense? So uh, to make a recognizable object, we chose letters because you can immediately see these by eye. But we could have chose, chosen any uh, combination of bits. Okay, So we, we took um, what we call a page of information. We broke it down into bits, 0 or 1. So they're just black and white here um, in this template. And to figure out what the hologram should be, we have to do another inverse problem. So we know what we want. And now we have some constraint. Like where do we put these molecules? So that when they're hit, they're illuminated by the electrons. And now we have electrons um, at all different energies, according to where they are you know, in, the, in the band structure. So we have some other degrees of freedom here. So they have different wavelengths, right, depending on the energy. Let's say you illuminate it then at some particular wavelength of electrons, then you know, where do we put uh, the molecules to get an S? Um, to solve this, you know, if you do the combinatorics, even let's say you just have you restrict yourself to 50 molecules, there are all those sites in green. You have some huge number of combinations to go through, which you'll never uh, fully exhaust in some calculation. So we can approximate, get, get as uh, close as uh, we care about by doing various kind of computer algorithms. This particular one is simulated annealing, which gave us this particular result. There could be other almost degenerate uh, arrangements that do just as well. And the, um, here's a, a realization of that hologram now made with these molecules. And that's the readout area. So remember, our simulation said we should see an S there, but it doesn't look like there's an S there. But remember, we have, more, we have a degree of freedom of changing the voltage with the wavelength. So let's go from 5 millivolts to just tweak this slightly to minus 30 millivolts. And then, bingo, we've got an S. Okay. So we, just like reading out the levels of an, of an atom, we're reading out now an energy level or an eigenfunction that happens to be shaped like an S, because that's how we encoded it. So we shape the wave function as an S. And I'll say a little bit later, more numerically, how many electrons we're actually uh, manipulating here and how many bits. So um, there's the S. There is a, an, a way to see this better is to take what's called a spectral map. So now we measure, and that, that previous thing was a, top, was a topograph. Um, this is a spectral map just at um, the ideal energy to read out that S. So it's measuring DIDV. We see a nice S. Okay. And uh, here's one way of seeing the, uh, the bits. So we um, encoded this into uh, basically, I think it was 8 by 12 array of bits. That's how, that was our design. And this is what we read out. So we read out here an S uh, with very high fidelity. Okay, so that's a test of what we encoded. So now, the one reason to do holography is to do um, volumetric storage. This is one step towards that. We put two letters. It's just a more complicated pattern. It has more bits in it. That works. And the S and U, this is for our university. Um, and so I told you I'd get back to graffiti. So this is now graffiti with electrons, but with a purpose for looking at information density. So here we retrieved what we encoded. But now for the kind of the killer app for this, the real holography, is taking um, these two pages of information but stacking them in this 3D object. So they're both, in, they're both basically stored in the same volume of space, okay, or the same area on the sample. So here's a topograph of this newly encoded hologram. Um, it's kind of nondescript here. Um, until we go to this energy level, and then we see and we get the S, which we encoded. We go to the next energy level, and we get the U. Okay. So these are both, maybe this is a good way to visualize it, um, <coughs> but we just, uh, two different pages, two different energy, but in the same uh, area, the same volume of space. Or you could look at it in terms of this 3D object, electronic object, which are these, this kind of gray curtain here, 
as we take slices through it, the, we encoded this information in these two different pages. Okay? So, and we can test how, test how good we, you know, correlation is with our, what we encoded. Um, that's what's shown over here. It's a it's good correlation. And um, you can see in this movie, we read out basically all these different pages, how this uh, object, 3D object, like basically materializes into these two pages that we encoded, the S and the U. Okay. All right. So, Sorry, I, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. So then you have superposition of of let's not even superposition. There's a number of these different energies, let's say exponential of these energies. If you look to the energy range, how many can you get on this fact by fact nanometer? So yeah, so I'll say this at the end. I'll tell you that I'll tell you how far we push at the very end. Yeah. Which is soon. Yeah. So hang on to that. I'll tell you just uh, now, come back to Feynman, and, and this is another part of the story. So in Feynman's original speech, um, he, he made a challenge at that were now called the Feynman Prizes. And some, some of you may have read this in the history or the lore, that the first one, he challenged, um, he challenged anyone, any scientist, student, whatever, to um, miniaturize writing this is on the way to like manipulating atoms. It's just, he said, well, look, there should be no reason why you can't just write really small. So he said he had a metric, some, uh, something like writing the first page, so small that you could write the first, you know, the page of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin. So as it, um, as it turned out, that Feynman Prize w <laughs> went unclaimed until uh, 1987, and it was won by a Stanford grad student. And this Stanford grad student, um, Bill Newman, did basically use e-beam lithography to meet, you know, to satisfy the prize uh, specification. Um, so here's a, a page from uh, Tale of Two Cities that's written small enough with a, uh, basically a half pitch. Half pitch is like kind of the feature size, small enough to satisfy this criterion. Okay, and that happens to be 15 nanometers. Okay, it's like the line thickness if you look at any of these letters. Okay, so look at this. This scale bar here is 500 nanometers, okay? And um, look at this uh, word here, it. And look at the dot of the I. My next view graph is an expansion, okay? It's the same scale as the size of the dot of the I, okay? Just to give you size. So that's five nanometers down here. Um, this is some recent work. People have done something similar, taking a high energy electron and carving out letters inside thin, through thin membranes with a TEM and an SEM. That's a small, happens to be an S I chose. Um, that's got 3.8 nanometer pitch size. This is the original IBM logo spelled out in xenon atoms by Don Eigler. It's not bad, it has a half pitch of 1.25 nanometers. You could ask how, if this is information density, how far can we push this? Um, what I just, the S I just showed you has a half pitch of 0.8 nanometers. Okay, that's already better than this, but that's, and this is written with electrons. The mat, there's no matter except for the matter outside, or the mole, which are the molecules, right, in the hologram. So again, how far can we push this? So um, you can think about drawing with atoms the smallest possible letter, okay? And so the limit there is that they have to register to the underlying lattice. So this is the smallest S we could write, um, which, ha which happens with atoms, is not with uh, carbon monoxide, but with copper atoms. Um, uh, and so that's a limit, except note that electrons have no such constraint because you can just keep going to higher energy and getting smaller wavelength, right? So, can we do better than the atomic size? So this is now a really tiny hologram. Um, looks like an unhappy face inside there, but we look at uh, the right energy, we get a very tiny S, okay? At a very high energy, relatively high energy, two volts, the wavelength's very small. And in particular, let me, okay, quick question, yeah. Yes, all it is is the voltage applied to the tip relative to the sample. 
So it's the energy of the tunneling electrons. Yeah. And so, and the reason why that corresponds to a different wavelength is because there's a, a dispersion of the surface state electrons. So di higher higher voltage. Yeah. Uh, diff uh, will be uh, higher K and shorter elect uh, wavelength. Okay. So let's compare where we were here. So this was our original S. This is the S written in copper atoms. And now this is all to scale. And this is the smallest S we've made with electrons here. The half pitch there is 0 0.31 nanometers. And this is really how the, uh, the ingredients of that S are really subatomic in size. There's a, it's a 5 by 7 grid. So that S is composed of 35, uh, 35 pixels, which are either 0 or 1. So that's 35 bits. And the area is so small that there's a single electron in that square. So this encoding represents 35 bits into a single electron. That's in the volumetric storage density. Or uh, 20, 20 bits per nanometer square, 35 bits per electron, which is remarkable. Um, and we think we could push it further, but that's, that was, that's, one, that's how far we pushed it in this experiment. So yeah. yes. OK, this is not actually counting, as a caveat, is not counting the area needed to make the hologram. It's, it's asking a more, I, I would say, fundamental question. Just looking at what's inside the, forgetting how the electron wave function gets shaped. What is ultimately the information density in some unit of volume? I guess the information density is effectively high because now you are looking to let it go up for the effect is say at 15 by 15 pixels. Every time your computer can distinguish the 15 by 15 pixels, you have another information density at a different energy. So you even not uh, restricted to the, to the to the letters of the alphabet. Yes, of course. Yes. You, you, yeah. In terms of energy, you have much more. Yes. Yeah. States or half states which contain information. That's right. That's right. So this is just one way of measuring it. it you could argue. You could argue, hey, it's smaller than that because of this stuff outside, but we're not counting that. Cause then, so then the, I would argue it's actually probably much bigger than this for the reasons you just said. Yeah. But even that's pretty impressive. So the, um, so the, the lesson, this actually made the, the, old, you know, the old Tonight Show. There was like uh, Jay Leno made a joke about it. I won't repeat it here. And so the, um, and some other uh, cover stories. So um, the lesson here is that uh, to answer Feynman's uh, challenge is wait. The more we push down, the more room we find. And we can, I think there's always room to go down further. So I can imagine that a single letter is, well, relatively OK to do. But yes. if you want to write an entire text, yes. then you need this to, is to a find, diff I mean, then you need to find the resonances of like uh, a bunch of uh, electrons. Yes, so, yes, so it's. Can um, you calculate this? It, it becomes very diff. I mean, you, yeah, not, not exactly. There's just too many combinations. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so if, if you had a quantum question. computer, maybe. But then if you have a quantum computer, you could do other, <laughs> <laughs> other stuff, too. That's more useful. So, so how many yeah. did you try? Like, so we've done in calculations like maybe f four, four to five letters. Yeah. yeah. And but we haven't realized all of those. We think they would work, but we got busy with other stuff yeah. like this. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. rest, yeah. 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 So okay. So the uh, let's. So let's. I, mean, I promised you I'd end now with the uh, with the stuff the graphene that we'll be talking about tomorrow. And uh, so this is the I mean, the first paper I put in there. Um, which was, if you look in the actual issue, was published back to back with a paper from the ultra cold atom community, where which was their first realization of kind of an artificial graphene. Okay, um, so um, we also wrote a review paper which is included um, that contrasts different methods for making these artificial lattices, in particular artificial honeycomb uh, lattices, and these are three, diff four different uh, methods. Ours, and actually they're arranged in order from smallest to largest, okay? This is really kind of, the right is macro scale. Um, the left two are the only ones in real condensed matter. So left is what I'll talk about. This, so this is, uh, this is what I'm gonna be talking about. This is, uh, is actually um, etched semiconductor quantum dots in gallium arsenide. Um, bigger, but actually they haven't really re uh, realized graphene. They realized the kind of a, um, 
a localized state on a, a localized states on a honeycomb lattice, so basically dominated by Hub, the Hubbard model. Um, the ultra cold atom community in that paper is our first realization of a honeycomb lattice. Um, they don't directly image it, but they, they do some dynamics, sending electron wave packets between the upper and lower Dirac cone. Um, the the uh, caveat is these, all these experiments in, in AMO are ultimately really just simulations of condensed matter. So there's no real, for example, Coulomb interaction. Um, the, uh, in contrast, basically, these are experiment and also the semiconductor one real materials have real Coulomb interactions and, uh, um, or rather, I mean, you could even say they're not really artificial materials because they're actually just uh, a superset of real materials. All right, so um, the, um, I want, and then I wanted to point out another thing. These are, the, why did everyone start doing, working on these honeycomb lattices? Well, of course, there was the excitement of, over graphene. But it turns out honeycomb lattices are very, um, um, have a lot of very interesting properties. Textbook, this Dirac cones, um, they're very symmetric, have interesting symmetries. They're very simple, Hamiltonian to solve. It's like a textbook problem. There's all kinds of applications for honeycomb lattices that have been pointed out. There's a particular one that I always think about when I go on a long plane ride, like I did when I came here, which is something that someone recently patented a couple years ago. Um, which is to use a honeycomb lattice to maximally pack people into an airplane. <laughs> or it's actually a modified, uh, a modified honeycomb lattice. And so um, if you think, if you have a crazy idea about a honeycomb lattice that's waiting, you, know, you can go patent it this, just like this guy did with this. So I think, well, my ride was a, a bit better than that. So I hope that never comes to fruition. The, so graphene. Um, I think many of you know about it. This is like kind of a high-level just summary of some of the most interesting things. Um, it's band structure known for a long time. These, this is a case space picture of the pi bands. Um, the most the, the recent interest is this analogy to the uh, relativistic uh, high-energy physics because uh, the fermions, the quasiparticles at low energy, approximate uh, the Dirac equation, um, with the caveat that you replace the speed of light with an effective Fermi velocity. It's still a speed limit to the system, which is about 300 times slower than the actual speed of light. But otherwise, you have the, uh, uh, the Dirac equation to play around with. And instead of real s spin, you replace the spin with a pseudo spin, which is the, um, the uh, projection onto the A or B uh, lattice sites, sub-lattice sites. OK. so. As a result, just like real relativistic, massless relativistic particles, you have chiral particles that are either right or left-handed, depending on the alignment of the spin, or the, here the pseudo spin and the momentum. And there's also an embedded Berry's phase in this, uh, in graphene. So, um, and then this is just to show you that, um, as we know from the Dirac equation, if you add a mass, you'll get a band gap equal to two mc squared. I'll come back to that. Um, without that, if mass is zero, then this is your spectrum diagrammed here, and you have the equation I showed you earlier, but just with now, here's the Fermi velocity instead of the speed of light. All right, so um, here's now, now I'm trying to bring together everything I talked about so far. We talked about controlling the structure to very high precision, basically putting the atoms where you want them. Here we're going to use those atoms to sculpt out a potential, okay? Um, uh, in some ways, very similar to the hol holography experiment I just showed you, okay, uh, in an open structure. And these will then confine or guide electrons. But now we don't care about what's in a readout area of a hologram, but actually what's inside, uh, so let's say, a lattice that we build. And then we want to control the phase. That's why I spent time talking about different kinds of phase. Um, as it turns out, the f you know, as the electrons propagate through from site to site, Large, you know, they're in phase, um, and, but we can, we can actually manipulate that phase, which we've done to create what are called um, artificial or gauge fields. This is how we realize a, a, a pseudo-magnetic field. Um, or uh, you can look at this as basically adding a fictitious Ejerana-Bohm phase to the electrons. And since they have this phase, 
they basically don't know the difference and they think they're in a huge magnetic field because they have the same phase they would if they were. Okay, but there is no actual magnet applying the field. So this has been a recipe for creating uh, some new topological states. So in a, this, is in a, this is a summary of um, some of the basic things that we've seen. Um, going from graphene, in, so this is theory and experiment. Very simple theory, just tight binding calculation. Um, the density that the states is calculated and what we read out from uh, DIDV. This is, shows massless Dirac fermions. We were able to create massive Dirac fermions by a perturbation, and then to embed a very large pseudo-magnetic field. These colors here represent the, the uh, basically a texturing of the hopping parameter, T, between sites, all different hopping parameters here. This, course, this particular one corresponds to a triaxial strain of the graphene. And, uh, and then data is very interesting. It has sort of some symmetry breaking and remarkably Lando levels that should form only in a magnetic field, but here we have no magnetic field, but yet the electrons still quantize into Lando levels. So as I mentioned, part of the motivation for this goes back to that holography experiment. Same ingredients. Here's my real graphene, and then here's our molecular graphene. Okay? They look very similar. Yeah, by eye, they all have the honeycomb pattern. The idea behind this and what we learned is from those other experiments, we learned that um, these CO molecules are locally repulsive entities. And actually, most molecules or atoms that we look at also are repulsive scatterers. We, we've tested that and actually quantified it in a number of ways. So if you were to um, put some gray dots on the vertices of a honeycomb lattice and attract electrons under those gray dots, okay, as if they were gates, then this, was one, this is one recipe for making an artificial form of graphene. Right? This could be quantum dots, and so you trap electrons. Um, but we have repulsive, not attractive, potentials when we put these individual molecules on the surface. But consider this problem. Put repulsive potentials everywhere there's a red dot. That's actually, um, if you connect these dots, you get a triangular lattice instead of a honeycomb lattice. The, you might have learned this in group theory. If you took it, it's called, these two lattices are called duals, or you can just see by either inverse of each other. And um, what make, hopefully makes sense, or we learned also from doing the experiments, is basically these two are equivalent for the electrons. So if you want artificial graphene, for example, then you can make a hexagonal array of attractive ga local gates or a repulsive array of tri triangular array of repulsive local gates. And our thinking behind this when we started these experiments also goes back to this experiment we did with gating of superpositions. We were really treating an atom as a gate with a, a local repulsive potential that we measured in those experiments. So um, we went back and calculated just, you know, back of the envelope calculations with this work with CO or cobalt or copper atoms. And they all seemed within the range of something that was possible. Um, and we, we tried it without doing, you know, more, more theory because it was something we wanted to try, try anyway. And it happened to work. We were lucky in some cases. We could do the reverse, too. You could switch attractive repulsive. So this one, for example, will give you a, a triangular real lattice for the electrons. Okay. So here's our uh, molecular graphene. Now that you know, it's called molecular because we've got um, these CO molecules basically punching out holes okay, where the electrons should not go. And in the vertices, there are actually um, little quantum dots there that are, that are determined by the three uh, repulsive potentials around them, they can find electrons. And if you, uh, uh, if you balance these uh, energies just right, you will get uh, some non-trivial quantum tunneling between those sites. And you can actually just read this off visually in the picture by what looks like a bond, sorry, it's an effective bond between those sites. Okay, so that's uh, the picture behind our molecular graphene. Um, the theory 
it can be attacked in different ways. Um, one way is to do a perturbation theory expansion of putting, um, starting with, there's a te another textbook quantum problem. You start with what's called the empty lattice. So you put in all the symmetries with no potential. So you wrap all the bands around to the right uh, um, Brillouin zone and you get what's shown here. Okay, so that's an empty lattice. And then you do a perturbation calculation uh, by slowly increasing these uh, voltages in the center, make them repulsive. You increase the potential there. And you will see, as I ramp up this potential, for some range of the potential, um, you will split off that third band and get these two crossing bands. And as it turns out, so many of you might recognize this, it's a textbook picture of the band structure of graphene. So the crossing point is the Dirac point. Um, these two flat areas here give you the Van Hove singularities. Okay. And you saw there's some range where this works. There's actually a range where it will not work. And as it turns out, our preferred method of manipulation, CO molecules on copper, the param and the, you know, the local voltage of a uh, repulsive voltage of a CO and its size just happened to, to work out. And so we're in that range. It didn't have to be, but it worked out. And also the wavelength of uh, Fermi wavelength of, of copper was also uh, conducive to these experiments. So uh, some of the history. So we started working on that. Um, we were working on this for like three years. This is another interesting story. This is uh, something maybe in uh, 2008 I had put into a research proposal to make this artificial graphene by doing this kind of manipulation. And so that idea was soundly rejected by everyone who reviewed the proposal. So I never got any funding. So, but we, you know, we did the experiment anyway. And, and, it, and it worked. We knew it worked right you know, as soon as we started doing it. But we worked uh, three more years to build up a library of experiments. And around somewhere in the middle of that, uh, Louis, Louis group came out with a theory of a, something similar. Um, he was thinking of taking a two-dimensional electron gas and putting physical gates on it that were attractive in a honeycomb pattern, like the first thing I showed. And he showed numerically, with perturbation theory, that for 2D, with using the parameters for gallium arsenide, that uh, the calculated density of states in the band structure corresponds w with good fidelity to graphene. So that was encouraging. Although these parameters are all for um, gallium arsenide, you can see Things are remapped to smaller energy scales than, than graphene, um, but it also like it, it also led us to um, look at beyond tight binding, and look at this perturbation theory. And later, what we did was we made a mapping between tight binding and this so-called nearly free electron model or the perturbation theory. So um, often with tight binding, you want to think of a hopping parameter. But for a real system, you might know band structure parameters, like the effective mass of the 2D electrons. And so this allowed us to make a mapping between these. We, this is all in the supplement of this uh, paper, if you want more details. Paco Guinea, uh, a theorist, helped us work, work out a lot of this. And this is the 2 by 2 Hamiltonian, Dirac Hamiltonian, in terms of the band parameters, for example. Um, but we could relate the effective speed of light to those band parameters. and basically M, M star and the lattice spacing or, and the tight binding uh, coefficients. So uh, the hopping parameter T and the second nearest neighbor hopping parameter to the same coefficients. So we showed that these actually both uh, work out okay, with, with high fidelity to um, our actual experiments. So let's uh, think, so one more movie here. So this is now the, the assembly. Now you've seen all the, the ingredients before. This is a movie of assembling a very tiny flake of this molecular graphene. Okay. And it looks like graphene, right? Um, and it has some kind of uh, edge structure, too. The, um, another view of this, this is from a calculation. This is actually a complementary calculation. This is using scattering theory. So we calculate where this is basically the, dent, the yellow is the density of states. It goes from something that is, uh, has very little structure outside to uh, this honeycomb lattice inside. Those are the molecules depicted inside, which we're moving around. Here's another way of understanding how electrons flow through this. They go, before they 
uh, they go through the surface, they, they're just going straight through until they hit this lattice. So outside they have, the per, they have uh, a mass given to them by the, you know, the parabolic, parabolic dispersion of uh, electrons out here. But magically, when they enter this lattice, it's as if they lose their mass. They become these massless Dirac fermions they pick up in, the, you know, in this new uh, Dirac band structure. And this particular uh, trace here is a calculation of a quasi just one quasi-particle trajectory of an electron going in, entering the lattice. It bounces around within a, a plaquette here and then uh, escapes. So this would be a tunneling event coming out. Um, and the st density of states you can look at is the superposition of all those different uh, quasi-classical trajectories. All right, so the test, though, is not whether this thing looks like graphene, but um, is it electronically graphene? And the way to test that is to look at the spectrum. And the short answer is yes, it is graphene, at least according to the spectrum. In fact, in many ways, we've looked at, you know, we look at real graphene. In many ways, this looks uh, better than real graphene when you look at this spectrum. Because real graphene has some other uh, anomalies. You know, and so anyway, the signatures here as we see this dip here, which is at the Dirac point, the two Van Hove singularities. We can, you can even read off the type binding parameters just by looking at that, like where, where EM is marked. That basically gives you the um, approximate value of T. So it's 100 millivolts. You can refine these values by doing a fit it's just tight binding fit, so you get all those parameters coming out, including the Fermi velocity. And that's a, so that, was, that gave us confidence in this and that we're actually forming these Dirac cones. That's from the data, um, the corresponding Dirac cone. And another test of this is graphene property, is to tunnel into each site, subsite A and B, and look at how the density of states changes with energy. Close to the Dirac point, this is a prediction, from the Dirac equation, the density of states has to vanish linearly. And the slope of that vanishing will give the Fermi velocity, or the effective speed of light. So um, as I mentioned before, this one sublattice site, let's say A, we assign a pseudo spin, I'll call it spin up. We get a linear uh, density of states. So, um, the, sorry, this is now, forget these signs, but this is density of states measured versus energy and uh, fit to a straight line. And then on the other uh, sublattice, another straight line, uh, these signs, this axis just flips that around so you can see this is a cross. And they both give the same slope and that's a direct readout of the Fermi velocity. And that agrees with the type binding model, which is, uh, which is further uh, corroboration. Okay. Another interesting check is if you build the dual of this lattice, a triangular lattice, which is, remember, a hexagonal lattice of the carbon monoxide molecules, then you don't see Dirac physics. Um, in fact, you see what matches a um, type binding calculation of a triangular lattice, okay? So, um, so things I will mention. What, of course, our motivation was not to just make graphene, but to go beyond graphene do things that were impossible in real graphene. Um, one thing to, that we, we can do with this atomic manipulation is really texture the local uh, bonding arrangement between the sites of the lattice, okay? So, um, and that locally changes T, right? Roughly in proportion to one over A squared, the distance. So uh, you could do that globally shrinking the whole lattice by the same lattice constant or expanding it, or you could do it uh, locally, all right? So, or modulate T locally. So we've done both of those. Let me tell you the simple one first, because it has a very interesting interpretation. So if we just, this is now just changing the lattice constant for the whole system, keeping it uh, hexagonal. So what I showed you before was actually a, had a lattice parameter that was uh, around 19 angstroms, that we had adjusted in order to get uh, neutral gra graphene, meaning the Dirac point right at the Fermi energy. So I mentioned some uh, helpful accidents. It didn't have to work out that way, but this worked out nicely given the parameters of uh, copper, and the, the, the Fermi wavelength or the density of electrons on the surface. So that's uh, Fermi level at uh, the intersect. Fermi level basically is right here. But uh, 
as you know, in real graphene, you can make N or P type by gating it. So you increase carriers and remove them. We can do the equivalent in this system. We can make P type and N type graphene. How do we do it? We don't do it with doping. We don't do it with gating. But we do it just by either shrinking or expanding the lattice. So why does this work? It, well, a simple way to see it is we have a fixed density of carriers on the surface. You expand the lattice, you increase uh, the area of the unit cell, and therefore you have more, uh, you increase the doping, you increase the number of electrons per site. And the opposite when you go to p-type, when you shrink the lattice. And, and so you can see this, you can just read this out, p-type and n-type by the shift in the Dirac point. Um, so it's a very powerful technique. As it turns out, it's an interesting uh, point that mathematically this is equivalent to a gauge field. So I mentioned gauge fields earlier in the context of magnetic field. Here, um, this, when you do this overall shrinking or expansion, the Hamiltonian changes by just adding a scalar potential and the gradient of that scalar potential um, is an electric field. And it turns out that electric field is perpendicular to the sample. So mathematically, what we're doing here is actually physically equivalent to gating a real graphene sample with a perpendicular electric field. So that's a connection to um, a real graphene sample. Again, the electrons don't know the difference, so you get N and P-type graphene. And um, this had an interest, uh, interested us for a long time. The, um, this is, uh, this is an old experiment I did at uh, IBM, the Quantum Mirage. It's actually a type of imaging device, taking some electronic structure, imaging it, projecting it from one focus of an ellipse to the other. In this case, it was a condo effect. Um, it's kind of like an open lens, but it has a closed structure around it. There's now uh, predictions, theoretical models, for how you can make so-called open lenses naturally in graphene. Uh, these are called Vesalago lenses. You use positive and negative uh, electron refraction that come together with P and N type areas sandwiched together. And you can do focusing in an open lens geometry without um, confinement. So the, uh, so this, this, since this requires, this and other experiment require very precise P injunctions, this is something we realized in our experiments by just sandwiching these areas together just to show and test whether we could do this. In this case, this is a P and P junction. And we tested, so these are the spectra in the three regions to show that it, indeed this is P and P, but we were interested also, you know, how fast does it change from P to N and from N back to P? So we took a spectra, spectral map um, or scan through um, the center of this ribbon. And you can see that, um, so here is, uh, um, this white line is marking the Dirac point. Okay, it's the the low part of the spectrum. And you can see that basically it changes from P to N type within one lattice constant on both sides, which is something that's far beyond what you can do in real graphene. So in, in fact, it's the best you can do. It's just atomic size gating. So, uh, so that's a particularly interesting application. Um, another application, something that was uh, speculated to um, be possible in graphene, mathematically you could calculate this, is to distort the bonds and make what's called a Kekulé arrangement. So this name goes back to, um, goes back to Kekulé who came up with the original theory of benzene, which we now know is wrong, but the quantum superposition of his ideas is correct. So he has this dimerized form, single and double bonds. Um, in graphene, you can make a static Kekulé uh, pattern. And this is shown here. This is what we did. So um, what we designed is this. This is not the only one that works. This one worked uh, particularly well. We add more CO molecules. They're represented by these gray dots. And uh, my students call these chevrons, these little triangles. And where the two points of a chevron pinch uh, are aligned together, they basically pinch off a bond. So they decrease T there. And where the uh, sorry, where the uh, flat areas in the single line up, that's a strong bond. So if you look, if you go around this plaquette here, it goes, um, 
strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, just like the calculator arrangement. And we, um, we uh, tweak the system so that the actual uh, ratio between uh, T1 and T2 here is a factor of two, just like calculator. All right. Theoretically, the prediction was uh, you should get, go from massless Dirac cones to these gapped Dirac cones. Okay. And another interesting point is there's a gauge field associated with this. It's a detail. Um, that gauge field is, um, is associated with a mass. And um, here's uh, some more details on that. So now it turns out that uh, Kekulé term distortion adds an off-diagonal term to the Hamiltonian. And the scalar gauge field ends up, uh, here's the Hamiltonian. So it's an off-diagonal term. Um, it has the same form as a Higgs field. And so it's basically a homemade instead of a spontaneously occurring Higgs field. And just like with a Higgs field, um, it attaches a mass to this previously massless relativistic particle. Okay. This mass is tunable, and um, we measured it. So it's clear now we go from gapless to uh, gapped graphene. We measure this gap, and it's about uh, 80 millivolts, or that's, about, that's a tenth of uh, the mass of electron. Okay, so that's an example of, and this is also something that can't be done um, easily or at all yet in, uh, uh, by hand in uh, real graphene. Some speculate it may be automatically happening with some interactions in real graphene, but this hasn't been visualized yet. Okay, the final thing I want to mention is now to go back to the magnetic gauge field. And this is a proposal that came from Paco Guinea, 2009, um, which uh, sounded quite absurd to me <laughs> or magical if it actually worked. And a lot of people actually didn't believe it um, when, when even after this was, uh, the theory paper was published. The prediction was that by straining, in this case, they calculated a real flake of graphene with a triaxial strain. Um, they calculated a, a very strong pseudomagnetic field out of the plane, an axial field in the center of the strained flake, so strong that it would Landau quantize the electrons. And you could read that out in the density of states. So this was some, something we realized we could do with a little more effort. Um, it requires building larger structures and then straining them, which we do by moving the atoms the same way they would move, they were strained in this way. So that stretches the bonds in a particular arrangement. Like I showed in that color map earlier, these are three arrangements. Um, an interesting difference between this and a real magnetic field is that real magnetic field breaks time reversal symmetry, but this does not. Okay. Now, it turns out some of the features survive. You still get Landau quantization, but you will not automatically, for example, pick up the chirality that you get from uh, a real magnetic field, okay? unless there's some other symmetry breaking. So um, here's uh, what we start with. This is the un an unstrained flake. We make this now hexagonal because uh, it's easier to, to visualize and do the trigonal strain, which is basically as if you had this flake, you're pulling on it in three directions, and it's collapsing in the other three directions. OK, so that's 0. According to the theory, there should be 0 Tesla, no strain. And with the theoretical parameters, this should be 15 Tesla, this small amount of strain, more strain, 30 Tesla, 30, 45, and then 60 in this paper. We went up to 60 Tesla. Um, some other interesting modulations happen. Um, let me enlarge the center of the zero Tesla and the maximally strained 60 Tesla flake. So you can see that basically on the bottom here, um, there's a symmetry breaking that happens. Every other site is light, and every other site is dark. So it goes light, dark, light, dark as you go around, um, which is not an accident. And actually, it's part of the theory. So and it actually goes back to not breaking time reversal symmetry. What's happening in this structure, since we're not breaking time reversal symmetry, is we see a, uh, it's as if the electrons in one Dirac cone see a downward pointed field, and the other Dirac cone feel, sees a field in the opposite direction. So together, there's no net field. Um, but if you're looking at something like Landau quantization, it should be the same in both uh, cones. So this is something we tested, again, by doing spectroscopy. Um, in the center of these samples. As we effectively ramped up this field, which was done by 
an increasing strain. And the colored traces are the data. These, are ca these gray traces are calculation. The, um, the thing that you should see is some incre you know, basically addition of wiggles coming in as you go up in field. And the most prominent of which is this peak at zero energy. And what we can do is then also compare to some calculations. Um, this dark gray curve is the calculation for a strain field of 60 Tesla and no real magnetic field. Remarkably, if you calculate what the electron spectra should be for zero strain, but a real field of 60 Tesla, this is what you get, this dotted line. Okay, this was actually pointed out in the original theory paper. This is using the parameters for, for our experiment. You can see from these calculations, hey, the electrons are doing basically the same thing in either case. And this is what we see, and we can see how things uh, change as we ramp up this field. So um, in newer experiments now, we've pushed this to 300 Tesla, and we can see, we can additionally resolve um, uh, extra Landau levels as we increase the Landau gap. So um, let me make one more final point here on this symmetry breaking. So these are, this is actually the spectra on the bright spots. The spectra on the dark spots, as it turns out, has similar features. Or what you mainly see here is a widening, or the in, it's actually a gap opening up, but it's missing the zero Lando level. This is actually, it ends up predicted, um, at the time we, had, we wrote this paper, it was just an obscure um, paper on the archive that predicted this. The, um, but it works out uh, well in that essentially the dark lattice sites have all the other Lando levels ex represented except the zero Lando level. So what you end up seeing is a Lando gap, but without the zero Lando level. And it works out beautifully in, these, um, in the measured spectra. Okay. So and it, it turns out that's a, basically a... a a topological effect that's unique to making a quantum Hall effect, but without uh, breaking time reversal symmetry. So, this, so now I think I'll go back to this that I put at the beginning of this section. Uh, I think I'll explain now, gra going from graphene to gap graphene now to um, seeing these quantized uh, quantum Hall state in, uh, in the strain graphene. Um, both scalar and vector gauge fields were involved. Um, if you think about it, this was an electric field, uh, something like electric field. There's a scalar field. This is a, a vector field, so there's a vector potential added to the Hamiltonian, and its curl gives us this magnetic field. We've since now combined um, electric and magnetic fields to make crossed E and B fields just with uh, strain. And um, if we can do that, there's other... Um, interesting things to do that haven't been realized in real graphene. For example, you can add together fields that are non-commutative, called non-Belian gauge fields, and interactions are also um, interesting in these systems. These are things that we've been working on uh, since these experiments. So I think with that, I will wrap up and you can ask any last minute questions. We still have one minute. <laughs>